Evening, everyone. I uh, thank you for your presence here tonight and the presence of the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, tonight, I'd like to begin similar uh, to how we how we had prayer with Scripture in the middle um, of our time. I'd like to begin uh, with the Scripture today, um, and so you should have. Uh, your sheet. Uh, if you don't have a sheet, raise your hand and we'll make sure to get you one. Sweet. Just a handful. So what we're going to do this time, just like last time, is invite you to partner up with somebody next to you. If three is necessary, just numerically, that's totally fine. And what I'd like you to do is just like last time, you're going to Pray antiphonally with this scripture passage, which simply means to alternate verses, to make the sign of the cross, pray the verses together, and then share one thing with your partner that sticks out to you. And so I will take just a few minutes to do this right now prior to continuing the rest of tonight's mission. So with that said, uh, please pray with your partner. Share one thing that sticks out to you, and we'll uh, start back up in about three or four minutes. Thank you. Thank you for your willingness uh, to pray with the scriptures and to share with one another the fruit of your prayer. Uh, if you weren't here last night, we, we did this same, a similar exercise with a different psalm yesterday. And I have us do this, not just because I'm trying to you know, fill up time, for example, but because I think it's a valuable exercise in seeking to live a holy life. Last night, we were focusing in on healing, and tonight, I'd like to focus in on holiness. And one of the important practices I would propose to you that is something that's not just an interesting idea that I have, okay, but uh, has been something that the church has actively promoted in two different ways uh, in the past 50 to 60 years, um, is the practice of praying with Scripture. Uh, this was highlighted by the Second Vatican Council, uh, and there was an entire document of the Second Vatican Council called De Verbum, on the Word of God. And so it talked about many things uh, in the life, in, in relation to the scriptures in the life of the church, but one of the things that the council talked about, about the Word of God, is it should be the heart of our prayer. And so praying with the scriptures is an absolutely essential way uh, to be able to foster a holy life and a fruitful prayer life. On a very practical level as well uh, is the fact that the scriptures are always available to you. You don't necessarily have, you know, Father Jesse in your pocket, right? You don't necessarily have access to the blessed sacrament all the time. If you work for ExxonMobil and you have to fly to Qatar, okay, you're not necessarily going to have access to the Blessed Sacrament on the plane ride over to Doha. However, you always have access to the scriptures. You have access to the scriptures in the Bible. You have access to the scriptures on your phone, or you can download an app, where even if you have data, you can still get access. So the scriptures are always accessible to us. They are more accessible to us today in 2024 than they ever have been in the history of the world. Okay, so we need to make use um, of the scriptures. The other thing I would say about this in regards to this practice of praying with scripture is it's also a fruitful way to pray with your spouse. Sometimes people will say, you know, you should pray with your spouse or pray with your family. But again, on a very practical level, sometimes the struggle is like, I don't know how to do that. Okay, well, you just experienced a very simple, concrete way you can pray with scripture. 
We pray with 27 yesterday, 23 today. That means that there is still 148 psalms that you have not yet, you know, prayed with your spouse. Um, and so even if you do this practice maybe once a week or once a month, you've got material now, right, just with the psalms alone for, you know, a number of years. Um, and so it's a great opportunity uh, to uh, be able to pray with your spouse in a fruitful way. And it doesn't take a degree. It doesn't take an exceptional amount of training. It literally just takes two people opening the scriptures together and sharing the word of God together. I mean, so it's a great, a great gift to be able to have the scriptures, the word of God. The other thing that's beautiful about integrating scripture into your life um, is that the scriptures will, aren't just out there, but they become part of, be, become part of you, right? They become part of your mind and your mindset. And so in difficult circumstances, if you have prayed with Psalm 23, for example, continuously or frequently, then in a time of great difficulty, the Lord can come to your assistance. I remember uh, when I found out that my grandmother was getting close uh, to the end of her life, and I knew that I wanted to try to get up there. I had been in religious life for about six years, uh, no longer than that, like 15 to 16 years at that point. And I hadn't had a ton of time with her recently. And so remembering this scripture passage in the midst of a situation where I knew my grandmother was at the end of her life, I got to say mass uh, in, in her house uh, just the same day that she ended up passing away. Um, so I remember landing back in Denver after having been in Spokane and just keeping in mind this scripture passage that even when I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, that the Lord is with me. I mean, so the scriptures are a companion to us in the midst of great difficulty. And so, little sidebar, scriptures, absolutely essential. The soul of our prayer, a great gift and blessing um, to uh, to pray with the scriptures. I'd like to begin uh, in this reflection on living a holy life with something um, from the first letter of St. Peter. This is from 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 13. Therefore, gird up your minds, be sober, set your hope fully upon the grace that is coming to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all aspects of your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. The Lord calls us uh, to a life of holiness. The Lord calls us to a life of greatness. And one of the interesting things um, about living a life of holiness is what St. Peter tells us in this verse 13. Therefore, gird up your minds, be sober. It's kind of an interesting concept. I don't think in this particular context that what St. Peter is talking about is like be sober in the sense of don't be drunk. I don't think that's the, the context of this particular scrap, scripture passage, what he means. But rather, uh, he is highlighting the call to holiness, the call to living a life of holiness in the Spirit is living in the grace and the confidence of Jesus, uh, that the sign of the presence of the Holy Spirit is not agitation, division, uh, but it is peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And 
One of the fundamental challenges that we face as a, as a people, as living uh, as Catholics in 2024, um, is the fact that we basically live in a world that constantly seeks to agitate us. We live in a world that constantly seeks to agitate us because basically like money is made by agitating us. You know, Facebook and TV and all of that, like what websites want, they want us to click on things, right? And what social media wants is to, for us to swipe things and like things. And so we're constantly inundated with things that are seeking to grab our attention and to sustain our attention frequently on things that are not actually helpful uh, to us. And so whether you're talking about like, you know, the right or the left politically, whether you're talking about, you know, whatever websites or media you look at, there is this reality that they're, they're frequently seeking to agitate us. And when we become agitated, when we become disturbed, when we become angry, when we become, when we lose peace, then we're not living soberly. We're not living as ideally as the Lord would invite us to. And so we're invited by the Lord, if we're going to live a holy life, if we're going to live a sustained holy life in Jesus, then we're li- called to live in this sober reality. And people will sometimes seek to agitate us rather than uh, to uh, give us peace. And so we're invited uh, to dismiss that out of our minds and keep focused on what's most fundamentally important. And one of the things that can be you know, fundamentally challenging about living a holy life is the fact of our own imperfections. Now, the fact of our own imperfections can be a cause of discouragement. It can be a cause of discouragement that I'm not a canonized saint yet, that I'm not as perfect as I wish I was. And sometimes, you know, the discouragement can simply be from ourselves, right? We look at our own life, we look at our own struggles, and we get discouraged and frustrated. Sometimes maybe it's our spouse, right, that highlights, you know, uh, some of our imperfections to us. You know, however, like, it becomes present to our minds, we can frequently uh, become discouraged. And one of the things that, you know, basically the saint who would, I would propose is like the saint of sanity and peacefulness, St. Francis de Sales, he says that when we're living a life of holiness, we are invited to follow Jesus. We're invited to be faithful to Jesus. But we need to be okay with the fact that we're not completely perfect instantaneously. Francis de Sales will go on to say that the instant transformation of a person from basically like a life of, of, of sin to a life of utter perfection happens very, very occasionally. Like the instantaneous transformations, he says, is equivalent in the order of grace to the resurrection of the dead is in the order of nature. And what he means by that is that, you know, the resurrection from the dead and people, somebody rising from the dead is a, Jesus, obviously, his resurrection is, is you know, this super abundant, amazing, supernatural reality. But even in the life of the church, when there's been a, a gift of somebody being raised from the dead, it's a... It's an extraordinary event. And this instantaneous supernatural transformation that takes place in the life of St. Paul or St. Mary Magdalene, that is an extraordinary grace that sometimes happens. But Francis de Sales will go on to say that we shouldn't seek after that. And we should recognize the fact that holiness and healing and even purgation in the spiritual life is something that a majority of the time happens in a gradual way. And that holiness uh, for most of us, 
know, is this gradual process. And part of what the Lord is doing when he's allowing us to be aware of our imperfections is that this is actually helping uh, to purify us. And so rather than being uh, completely distraught by our own imperfections, we're invited by the Lord uh, to allow these things to actually become means by which he makes us holy. And Francis de Sales basically states that there's kind of two different extremes that we can go to in seeking to live a life of holiness. One, he says that we can become too easily dissatisfied, discouraged, and disturbed. We can be tempted to give up the pursuit of holiness because of our imperfections. And so, uh, rather than even trying, we just kind of give up the fight because we think the fight is impossible. And so we lose that sobriety of mind, we lose that confidence um, in Jesus and being able to live this life of sustained holiness. And so Francis de Sales also highlights on the other extreme uh, that we can have, so if, if you know, one extreme is to be dissatisfied, discouraged at our imperfections, to be excessively harsh on ourself. Uh, the other extreme that we can be tending towards if we're striving to live a life of holiness is that we have like these delusions of grandeur about our own state of holiness. I remember one time when I was in college, uh, I just started doing, I just started receiving spiritual direction. Uh, from a a priest at Franciscan University where I went, I remember experiencing a time of desolation in prayer. And what desolation in prayer is, is, you know, this idea of like, you go into prayer hoping for sweetness and consolation and like feeling good, right, when when you experience a time of prayer. And desolation is basically the opposite of that, right, where it's like rather than experiencing sweetness, the sweetness of spiritual honey, you get spiritual vinegar, right? And it's not a great experience, and you're like, I'm distracted, and rather, I'm, maybe you're even in the chapel here, and rather than being focused on Jesus and on the beautiful monstrance, right, you're thinking about the four things that you forgot to do uh, at work yesterday, or you get worried about all of the different uh, challenges going on with your kids, and you walk out of the chapel and you're like, what did I just do, right, for that 30 minutes? Like, I was thinking about Pokemon, I don't know. Um, and so, so when we get distracted uh, and we experience desolation uh, in prayer, uh, this, this is, you know, a, a struggle that we have, right? So we experience desolation. So I was experiencing in college this time of dryness and desolation in prayer. I had gone to the chapel you know, a few times and just was getting nothing out of it. It was like hitting my head against a brick wall, right? And so I went to the priest. I'm like, Father John, uh, Father John Gordon, who's a priest of uh, Archdiocese of Newark, and he was working at Franciscan at the time. I said, you know, Father Gordon, I think I'm in the dark night of the soul, right, of St. John the Cross, right? And... The dark night of the soul, right, that St. John the Cross talks about is like for people who are really, really advanced in holiness, right, and, you know, it's after like years and years of consistent prayer life and, you know, seeking Jesus, and I was equivocating my experience, right, of being this random college student who had one or two days of like struggle in prayer with this, you know, something that, you know, these really elevated saints experience, right, and that disposition, right, to overly estimate ourselves in terms of how advanced we are in prayer is a possible extreme, right, that we can tend towards in a life of holiness. So we can either think, uh, we can either think we're like really, really terrible and become discouraged and dissatisfied with ourselves, or we can canonize ourselves, right, before we've died, right? And one of the things, FYI, about becoming a canonized saint is you got to be dead, Okay, there's no, there's no pre like canonization for people, right? Like, the only you get canonized, the one condition on top of the many other conditions, the most basic one is you got to be dead, 
okay? And none of us are dead right now, um, and so we can't canonize ourselves. And so we want to avoid uh, this you know, tendency towards overestimating ourselves or underestimating ourselves, of being excessively harsh on ourselves or becoming overly, you know, overly overestimating ourselves and, and pre-canonizing ourselves when we're really maybe at the beginning. I mean, so one of the things that Francis de Sales said is that I found super helpful is we should not be disturbed at our imperfections since perfection consists in fighting against them. And if we can't fight without seeing, and we can't overcome unless we face them. And so we want to just be mindful of this reality, right? To avoid these two extremes of overestimating or underestimating ourselves. Now, the second concrete thing that I want to highlight for you about living a life of holiness and the concreteness of life um, is that one of the ways to grow in holiness that I highlighted a little bit yesterday is this idea of attachment, of inordinate attachment. Uh, so we can have an inordinate attachment to created things. We can also have an affection or attachment to sin. And one of the things that many of the saints will talk about, including both Ignatius and Francis de Sales is this idea that if we're going to live a holy life, we need not only to try to reject sin itself and, and repent from sin, repent from sin and be faithful to the gospel, but we need to go even deeper and beg for the grace that the Lord take away our affection for sin, our attachment uh, to those particular sinful tendencies within us. And so, uh, if you struggle with sin, like I think most of us in the room do, uh, one of the things to be mindful of as you seek to live a life of holiness, again, not becoming distraught and not becoming overly harsh on yourself, but honestly looking at your life in the context of prayer and asking yourself the question, not only what are the obvious sins that I'm struggling with in this season of my life, but what are those attachments to created things, those inordinate attachments to created things that I need to allow the Lord's grace and mercy to work on in my life? And what are the, maybe the affection or sin that I had. And one way to kind of know that there's still an affection or attachment to sin, or to at least like some sinful tendencies, is this, I, this, this tendency sometimes within us that like, you know, if I had the chance, right, I would do this thing. If I had the Maybe if I'm angry with somebody, if I have an inordinate attachment to anger and to retribution, I think to myself, like, if I saw, you know, if I saw this guy, you know, if I saw Tim, you know, I know Tim, hey Tim. So let's say I was mad with Tim, right, and I'm back in Denver, and I'm just thinking to myself, like, man, if I saw Tim in the next few weeks, you know, I would just, I would want to punch him, right? And and just holding on to that resentment, holding on to that anger, even though I don't have the opportunity like on a physical level to punch Tim necessarily tomorrow, the fact that I'm holding on to that, the fact that I'm fostering that anger within myself, that is an inordinate attachment. I remember as well, one of the inordinate attachments in my own life uh, was when I first started working and, and teaching after I had finished undergrad and I started working at a Catholic high school, in the first year at the school, I was by myself, like in terms of I was the only, I was the new guy at the school, and most everybody else at the school was 
you know, had been around for a while. And then the second year that I was there, a friend of mine from college actually ended up coming on staff as well. And we we're, you know, partners in ministry, ministry uh, that second year. And I started to recognize within myself right, this tendency towards jealousy. Like if that particular person was meeting you know, with a student, and we actually had to share an office for a while, which is kind of annoying to maybe part of like the whole thing of why it was a struggle, but like I would have to, you know, sometimes leave the office in order for this person to meet with whoever they were meeting with. And I started to notice within myself, like I'm not, I'm becoming jealous, right, of, of this person. And, and even if I'm not actively sinning, I notice within myself like this tendency towards jealousy. Another thing that happened uh, in my first year of priesthood, so some years after that, was I, uh, when I first started, you know, hearing confessions, for example, um, it's like an exciting thing, right, when you get ordained and, you know, you're a priest for the first time. You know, I had the interesting situation of I, because of the, the newness of my community, the, my ordination, the, the diaconate was basically postponed relative to the rest of my seminary class. And so I ended up getting ordained to the diaconate in March of my like, senior year of seminary. And so then I got ordained a priest in May, right? So it was like a two-month period, right? So, I, you know, a lot of new priests, you don't really know what you're doing, right? But like, I especially didn't know what I was doing, right? Because I had barely like even had the opportunity, you know, to be a deacon for all that long. So I remember going to a life team camp, you know, a week or so after I got ordained. And I was like, I'm literally like trying to figure all this out, like while I'm celebrating mass for, you know, 200 and 300 kids. I mean, so, but during that time, that first few months of, of being, being ordained, one of the, the struggles that I had when I would hear confessions or, or do ministry as a priest, is I would have this thought within myself at certain times uh, of like, so I'm, I'm hearing this confession or I'm leading this mass or whatever it was, and I have this thought come into my mind like, man, if Monsignor Leone was here, uh, who is a, a priest, uh, who is a mentor to me up in Denver, like he could probably you know, hear this confession a lot better. He could give a lot better advice, right, than I could. And I struggled for, for a few weeks, for a few months, uh, with this, this tendency to, like, self-deprecation, right, this tendency to attack myself in some sense, rather than being, you know, confident in where the Lord had placed me, the fact that it wasn't me that chose him, but that he chose me and appointed me, just from John 15, you did not choose me and I chose you, but I chose you to, and appointed you to go and bear fruit. And so I had to come back to that fundamental truth that the Lord had chosen me, that the Lord had appointed me, that he had set me apart as his priest. And so if he had put me in a situation, he was going to give me the grace to fulfill it. And so we can even have like inordinate attachments like that where we're, it's not just like an obviously bad thing, right? It wasn't so obviously bad to me that I so clearly knew uh, that this was something that was undermining my pursuit of holiness, but nonetheless it was. I mean, so I just invite you, as you seek to live a holy life, to be mindful not only of the obvious, you know, sins, uh, the struggles that we all have, but also to just be mindful and aware right, of the ways um, in which uh, we can tend uh, to fall away, that we can tend to undermine the plan and the purpose um, that the Lord has for us. And then finally, be of good courage. Be of good courage. Jesus says, I have overcome the world. One of the things that should give us confidence is the fact that God has already won. 
Jesus has already risen from the dead, and we're just accessing his victory. And even though things in the world can seem crazy, and I live in a crazier place, okay, than Texas. So, like, I live in Colorado, right? It's crazier than here. Even though the world is crazy at times, and even though situations in our family are sometimes challenging and seem overwhelming, the Lord is victorious, right? The Lord is greater than all of those things. And if Jesus is risen from the dead, then any of the struggles, any of the challenges that we face are really nothing in comparison with the power of his goodness and his resurrection. And so don't give up the fight. Don't give up the fight of living a life of holiness. Don't become discouraged, even when there's division within the church, even when, then, when there's disagreements, arguments, all of the craziness that sometimes exists and frequently exists in our world. Don't become discouraged because the Lord is still with us. That the Lord is still calling. The Lord is still calling men to be priests. The Lord is still raising up holy families. Uh, the Lord is still giving people the grace to persevere in following Jesus, and that it's possible to do. Um, so in the midst of you know, different circumstances that you might be facing that are, make you question or wonder, don't give up hope. Uh, don't give up hope. The Lord is always faithful. And God raised up God raised up in the midst of World War II, Pope John Paul II, this amazing man, right, who endured unimaginable suffering, right? He lost his father, his mother, and his uh, brother, and uh, he had a young sister that died when she was very young. He lost his entire immediate family uh, before he had turned the age of like 22. And yet the Lord raised him up to be a great saint. Even in the midst of the chaos of World War II, uh, in the darkest situation um, at Auschwitz, God raised up St. Maximilian Kolbe. And one of the amazing things about Maximilian, if you've never uh, read his story, there, there's kind of two amazing things. One was his decision, right, to offer himself to offer himself um, in place of uh, this young man who had a family. That's amazing in and of itself. But I think the more amazing thing um, is that Maximilian was not killed instantaneously. He wasn't uh, put in uh, the, the gas chambers. He wasn't you know, shot at a firing squad. Maximilian was put into a starvation bunker with a number of other companions. And one of the amazing things that took place in that starvation bunker was they just kept singing and they kept praying. And many other times when the Nazis would uh, basically torture and kill people in this way, you know, you'd hear like these terrible, the terrible cries of agony and screaming. And when Maximilian was in the starvation bunker, neither he nor any of his companions, you never heard screaming, agitation, you simply heard the peaceful praying of these holy men. And so amidst whatever situation you might be facing, keep singing, keep praising the Lord, uh, keep calling out to him, not in agitation, but in confidence, uh, to know that he is with you, that he is fighting on your behalf. Uh, this is the great promise of the New Testament, the Old Testament, it's the promise of the book of Exodus, where God himself says, I am fighting for you. And Jesus has fought for us. Jesus has chosen each of us, called each of us by name. And we can walk in confidence because of that. And I'll close with this uh, final story. I remember when I had the opportunity, the grace and blessing, uh, to be able to make a poverty pilgrimage. And uh, this is a practice that uh, as servants of Christ Jesus, we basically appropriated from uh, St. Ignatius. And I remember 
This is back in like 2006, 2007, so quite, a, quite some time ago. But I remember the first night when we were on this poverty pilgrimage where I, I did it in Northern California and then the goal was to get to, to Southern California. So fairly beautiful poverty pilgrimage, even though I didn't have any money, at least I had sunshine. Uh, but so we begin this poverty pilgrimage and we ultimately, uh, the first day we had zero idea where we were gonna be was uh, when we were going, and I had some companions with me. Now when we do this, we just send a guy off by himself. But at that time, you know, it was me and a few other guys, but we showed up in Carmel, which is where uh, now St. Unipro Sarah is buried. We had no idea where we were going to stay. We had no money, uh, nothing, right? We just had our Bibles and a few other things. We had no means of provision. We got to the church uh, to have Mass honoring the feast day of at that time blessing Unipero Sarah. And we were a little bit anxious because the Mass was in the evening and we didn't know where we were going to stay that night. So I was kind of worried. And I remember right as we were walking into the church, we met uh, two ladies who were docents. They were like guides to, to the shrine. And we shared with these two ladies, you know, hey, we're, you know, these brothers who were on this pilgrimage. We don't have any food. We don't have any money. We don't have any place to stay. Like, you know, can you help us? And the, the first lady who is probably in her 80s, she said, well, I have like a one bedroom apartment and there's a few of you. Like, we don't, I don't have room for you. And I was like, all right. We, now, mind you, at this point, we'd already been rejected by the priest. Um, at the parish already. Like, so we had asked for his help, and he was like, no, I'm about to do this Mass. And I even asked him, like, well, you have, like, it's the summertime, you have an empty school, like, can we just, like, stay in an empty classroom? And he was like, no, right? So we'd already been, at this point, rejected, right, by, by the priest. So we were already, like, had a few, we didn't have any Ws at this point, right? It was all losses. And, and so we, you know, to talk to the first lady, she says, I don't have any space, I have a one-bedroom apartment. The second lady uh, ended up saying, well, let me talk to my husband, but I think we might have some floor space for you. So I said, okay, well, we at least have the hope of after Mass, uh, maybe something will work out. And so we go to Mass. I'm mostly, I think, anxious about what's going to happen, who is this person, her husband, that we're going to meet after Mass. So mass happens, you know, the priest that rejected us is celebrating it, so it's kind of a conflicted experience. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, we get through the mass and we walk out of mass and we end up meeting, Joan was her name, uh, we ended up meeting her husband, who ended up being this guy, Dr. Jan Belza. He was a World War II veteran, amazing man. He, he ended up actually being uh, like the, I believe the chair of neurology at Stanford Medical School, and just like this amazing, amazing man. And, and they said, you know, I, I, we, we talked and we're happy to have you, but we have this Knights of Columbus dinner that we got tickets for, but we only have two tickets and there's multiple of you, we don't have any tickets. So we'll, we'll like give two of you the tickets, we'll wait outside and then like two of you can go and then we'll figure out the rest later. So they were being super sacrificial. And right as this, they were saying this, this one lady comes up to us and is like, we have all this extra food from a luncheon. Like, do you guys want the food? And we're like, yes. And then like five seconds later, another uh, person comes up to us and we're like, they were like, we have four tickets. The exact number of tickets that we needed uh, for the Knights of Columbus lunch uh, dinner that was sold out. And Dr. Belza, you know, then said, you know, I think the Lord is working, right? Like, you know, not only do we have all this, like, extra food that we weren't even going to be able to eat that night, but then additionally, we ended up having these, you know, four tickets made available to us. And this was like a Knights of Columbus dinner, not like, you know, a fish fry, nothing against fish fries, but this was like Pebble Beach, like, nice... Uh, this was like nice food, there was wine everywhere, right? So it was uh, this awesome dinner that we got to experience. And then 
After this amazing dinner, Dr. Bells is like, you know, grabbing food from the different tables and like stuffing it into a bag for us. <laughs> and then we eventually, you know, the four of us get into two different vehicles. Uh, I rode in, in Mrs. Bells's car and then some of the other guys rode in Dr. Bells's car. And then we're driving through uh, Pebble Beach, which I didn't know much about Pebble Beach, but it was amazing. And the place, the first night where we had no idea where we were going to stay, right, we, open, we drive up to this gate. The gate opens to this amazing mansion. There's a guest house. And I'm like, I think you have more than a little bit of floor space for us, right? <laughs> like, you have like an extra guest house and then like a second guest house attached to your garage, right, which is, you know, bigger than the house that I live in. And the ne their next door neighbor was Clint Eastwood, right? So it was like, now, to be honest, I didn't get to meet him, but, but just thinking about that reality of, I had nowhere to stay that night, in my mind. I had no money, had no food, and the Lord provided. And ultimately, like, if, if the Lord can do that for me, then the Lord can do anything. I never, in that whole month of being on that poverty pilgrimage, I never didn't have a place to stay. On that poverty pilgrimage, I never had a time where I didn't have something to eat in a day. The Lord always provided. The Lord will always, 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 always provide for you. The Lord is faithful to you. He will never abandon you. He will never forsake you. He is not out to get you. Right? He's not, his purpose in life is not to wait to see if you make a mistake so he can kick you to the curb, okay? Like, he loves you with an everlasting love. His love is steadfast. And so when we encounter him in the Eucharist, we encounter him in that reality of this steadfast love of God who loved us so much that he not only became man, but he becomes present to us on the altar tonight because he loves us and he wants to be with us and he invites us to just abide in him and so as we have adoration tonight this second night of adoration my prayer for us um, is that the lord would simply be with you that he would console your heart uh, in the midst of whatever trials that you're facing that he would give you courage where you're afraid, uh, that he would give you consolation in pain, that he would give you healing in any areas of brokenness, uh, that his love would be concrete for you and for me tonight, because that's who he is, that's what he's about. Uh, he's about providing, he's about fathering, he's about loving us. Uh, even to the end. And so as we get ready to enter into adoration, uh, let us beg for that grace uh, to experience the love, the love of the Father, uh, the mercy of the Father uh, poured out for us, given to us, not because we deserve it, but because uh, he has chosen us, not because we have earned it, uh, but because he has freely poured out his mercy and grace to us tonight.
salutari sostia que celi pandi sostium bella premunto silia daro Begin this time of meditation tonight. Just invite you to, in your own mind and heart, to begin with thanksgiving to the Lord, the gifts and graces that He has done for you. So maybe just taking a few minutes to just call to mind. Three graces or three blessings from this past year to give thanks to the Lord for those things as we pray tonight. And then in a few minutes, I'll invite us to pray for a few other particular graces where we begin tonight just by prayers of gratitude to Jesus.
having giving, given thanks uh, for the different blessings uh, that we've been given, different ways in which uh, the Lord has so abundantly poured us mercy and grace. We now just want to take a bit of time uh, to ask the Lord um, to work upon our hearts, especially in regards uh, to those inordinate attachments or the affection uh, for sin, the attachment to sin or sinful tendencies that we might have. And this obviously uh, can be kind of you know, scary to ask uh, the Lord to remove that and yet the Lord is the most gentle gardener. Uh, he doesn't go through the garden of our hearts in a reckless way, but rather he gently removes uh, something that is not fostering goodness and growth and seeks to leave the rest of the garden of our heart unharmed. Um, and so uh, we seek to humble ourselves before Jesus in adoration tonight. And we ask him uh, to both call to mind within our hearts some inordinate attachment we have, whether it be to anger, resentment, whether it be uh, to some particular sin, a lack of temperance, whatever it might be that is a particular struggle for you uh, to bring that attachment before uh, Jesus, uh, to offer that attachment to the Lord and to ask uh, him to uproot anything uh, that is not of him that needs to be uprooted so the garden of your heart uh, can blossom with the flowers of God's grace. And so we just take a few minutes to offer one or two uh, inordinate attachments, one or two attachments to sin that we might have uh, in the silence of your heart. I invite you to bring that before Jesus at this time.
having asked the Lord uh, to remove uh, those inordinate attachments, those any tendencies within us to be inclined towards that which is not good, uh, having asked him to remove that whenever a, something bad is removed, a weed is removed from a garden, there's obviously a space that is left in a garden afterwards. And similarly, within our own hearts, when something, the Lord takes something out which is bad, there's a space uh, that remains. And so we're invited to ask the Lord uh, to fill that space with his goodness. And so we can ask the Lord to fill that space with joy. We can ask the Lord to fill that space within our hearts with his peace. We can ask him to fill that space with courage, with confidence. And so at this time, just invite you uh, to ask the Lord to fill that space in your heart where you had, you had asked him to remove uh, that bad thing and asked him to fill it with something good, with peace, with his joy, with his grace, with his kindness, uh, with his confidence, with his courage. So for these next handful of minutes, I invite you to ask the Lord to fill up that space. And having asked the Lord to fill up that space uh, within us, we just now take a few moments to rest with him. Jesus says, come all you who labor and and are burdened and I will give you rest. You will find rest for yourselves. So we just take a few minutes to abide in him, to remain in him to contemplate him, to rest in him.
Christ. Antum ergo sacramentum venenem oicenui et articum documentum novo cenod ritui prestet fide supplementum sensum defectui genitori genitoque lasset jubilatio salus honor virtus coque sid et benedixio procet in diharu choque compassi la dazio You have given them bread from heaven, having all sweetness within it. Let us pray. O God, who in this wonderful sacrament have left us a memorial of your passion, grant us, we pray, that to revere the sacred mysteries of your body and blood, we may always experience in ourselves the fruits of your redemption. We live and reign with God the Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Blessed be God. Blessed be his holy name. Blessed be Jesus Christ, the true God and true man. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be his most sacred heart. Blessed be his most precious blood. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. Blessed be the great mother of God, Mary most holy. Blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. Blessed be her glorious assumption. 
Blessed be the name of Mary, Virgin and Mother. Blessed be St. Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be God in his angels and in his saints. Amen. May the heart of Jesus and the most blessed sacrament be praised, adored, and loved with grateful affection at every moment in all the tabernacles of the world, even to the end of time. Amen. Holy God, we praise thy name. Lord of all, we bow before thee. All honor thy scepter claim. All in heaven above adore thee. Infinite thy vast domain, everlasting is thy reign. Infinite thy vast domain, Everlasting is thy reign. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for all the graces that you've poured out upon us and the gift of adoration. Pray that you'd continue uh, the work that you've begun in us, that you bring it to ulti ultimate fulfillment, uh, even to the day of Christ Jesus. And we ask this all in Jesus' name, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. As, as last night, uh, we'll have the opportunity uh, for prayer teams, prayer ministry, like we did last night. Uh, so feel free to avail yourself um, of that. Also, I uh, just wanna let you know, right, that I will be uh, personally praying for all of you. Know that uh, even though I don't live in Texas, Texas is always in my heart, and St. Anthony's in a particular way uh, is always in my prayers. And you know, I come back every year to help out with the confirmation retreat uh, because I have an, a infinite debt of gratitude uh, that I keep trying to pay back, but I haven't, uh, haven't paid off the bill yet. So, uh, um, so please know that you're in my prayers, and I'll be praying uh, for all of you. And then uh, pass it on to Kate, who can give any concrete instructions. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you, Father Paul. What a beautiful gift 
um, these last two nights have been. So thank you so much for um, paying it forward, paying it back. Um, so we're going to break into um, prayer groups tonight. And just before we do that, I um, just a service announcement. There are baskets in the back if you would like to pay forward. So we were blessed to have Father Paul here. We have um, other amazing speakers we're hoping to get to come and do retreats like this at the parish more often. And so um, as you pay it forward in the basket, that will help us to bring other people. So um, just um, for those who are in the prayer teams, if you could just step away from the altar and go around to the outside so that people who want to stay and pray are looking at Jesus and not at you. And um, so if you could just stand up now and go to your places, and then you're more than welcome to stay and pray quietly. Um, go to one of the many prayer teams we have and have them pray for you. Um, let's think of one thing, maybe, that you would like them to pray for with you, and um, they would be glad to do that. So we hope you all have a blessed evening, and please stay if you'd like to stay and pray or head home. Thank you so very much. God bless you. And thank you again, Father Paul. <laughs>